Welcome to Wednesday, Wednesday New Day Bible Study at uh, Community Baptist Church in San Jose, California. Our pastor is Reverend Dr. H. Lee Turner. My name is Brother Jim Kennedy, and Sister Marie Dreyer is uh, filming this course so that we have uh, these studies on Wednesday. We thank you for her uh, blessings that she gives us to so we got a great lesson. We start a new uh, series, and uh, we'll be in First Peter, uh, starting at the first verse. And our topic is living hope in a broken world, and uh, I think this is a timely lesson. Uh, the things that are going on, and it's uh, kind of amazing how uh, these books have been written probably uh, three or four months before this events happened, you know, and uh, so it just shows just that uh, God's timing is the best timing we can have, you know, for this right here. So uh, I thank for this right here, this uh, lesson here. And we'll start off in, uh, with the introduction. Uh, and uh, I mean, well, first of all, we'll have our prayer and prayer request. Uh, there's a couple of prayer requests that we're still praying for. We're praying for the Walker family and uh, Roderick uh, Walker and his healing Lord. We pray for uh, uh, Georgia Payton family. Connie for healing of her body, uh, Rosetta Cooper, uh, jo Giovanni Washington and Mel Washington, the Collins family, Richard and Estelle Fulton's family, Sister Viney, Brother Camp's family, uh, Sylvia's family, and Alicia Bonner's nephew for his health, uh, Micaiah for healing and uh, Sister Rucker. And um, we pray for our country as a whole, Lord, and uh, what we're going through. Uh, and uh, we pray for our, our, our pastor and his family and uh, just the church family, our church family, Lord. And pray that everyone's safe. So I'll um, read a scripture. I want to read a scripture from Ephesians 3, I'll read, uh, 3, Ephesians 1, chapter 1, 3 to 23. And it says, Blessed be the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. According to as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption, to his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, where he has abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has proposed in himself, that in the dispension of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom we also trusted after he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption 
and uh, the purchase procession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us Lord, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he had wrought in Christ, and he raised him from the dead and set him at, the, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that fills all and all. And a blessing be to the hearing and reading of Ephesians uh, chapter 1, 3 through 23. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our God, Lord. We thank you for your holiness and your righteousness, Lord. We thank you for so many things you do for us, Lord. We lift up these prayers to you today, Lord, that we mentioned earlier. Feelings of families, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you just bring peace uh, among this nation, Lord, and let us unite together, Lord, and be one family, Lord, that, like you would want us to be, Lord. We, we uh, ask that you order our steps, Lord, today, Lord, and let the Spirit minister to our hearts, Lord, as we have a, another great lesson from your word, Lord, your scriptures, Lord. We thank you. For, Lord, uh, just being with us, Lord, let the Holy Spirit guide us and direct us today, Lord. We pray for each one out there. We pray for the George Floyd family, Lord, and the loss uh, of the killing of uh, uh, George Floyd, Lord. We pray, Lord, that justice will come, Lord. And we pray for our uh, country as a whole again, Lord, that uh, Lord, with justice and uh, uh, peace will be among us, Lord. And Lord, we pray uh, for the, all those going through uh, the, uh, the crisis of uh, the health, Lord. We pray that each one is safe and keep themselves safe, Lord. We just uh, thank you for this day, Lord, a brand new day that we never saw. Lord, we pray for this lesson today, Lord, that we will get uh, fruit that you want us from uh, um, this lesson. Thank you, Lord, and we pray this all in Jesus Christ. Name. Amen. Okay, we got another great lesson. I'm going to read the introduction, which is on page 13 of this book here. It's called Living with Hope in a Broken World. It says, Hope comes in a lot of size and shape. We hope our investment and finance and planning will pay off when it comes time to retire. We hope that the next uh, diet will be the one to get us back on track. We hope the candidate we elect will make a positive difference. We hope that the weather will be perfect for our upcoming vacation. While we might feel confident that our hope is well placed, such hope is never certain. People disappoint, circumstance change. Christ, however, is faithful and unchanging. When we place our trust in him, we gain a hope like no other. Because the believer hopes rest in Christ, we know our hope in him cannot be shaken. Therefore, we can approach the question and challenges of life with confidence. Our hope in Christ gives us courage to stand strong in a broken world. Our hope in Christ sets us apart from the rest of the world in how we face suffering and how we respond to difficult circumstances and then ultimately gives us a platform to share God's goodness and hope. When your, when your hope wavers or when you're tempted to place your confidence on earthly things, that disappoints. How can you remain anchored in Christ as you hope? 
This study will examine the uniqueness and basis of biblical hope, whether it's suffering, pain, prosperity, or contentment. Uh, learn to place your hope in God alone and testify of his hope to the world around you. And then the first question is the basic of our hope. And it says, when have you been glad you didn't give up? And secondly, I, I would say that uh, when you're trying to achieve something, you always have like there's always plateaus. And so when, when you want to accomplish something, if you don't give up, you hit that new plateau. Uh, you, and then uh, you're glad because you overcame uh, where you were and you uh, now advanced. Uh, so I think that's the goal, the central goal of, uh, you know, things we hope for here. Uh, when you reach a certain goal, like in sports, maybe you had a certain level for a long time and then all of a sudden you uh, advance to the next level and, and the whole game is different. So. That's what I thought of that question. Okay. And then uh, the point, our hope is in Christ is sure and certain. The passage is 1 Peter 1, 1 to 9. The Bible meets life. Florence Chadwick was a champion long distance swimmer. She swam the 21 miles across the English Channel in 1950 and she did it faster than any other woman in history. In 1952, she uh, set her sights on a long clear goal, the 26 mile route between Catalina Island and the California mainland. Through an oil leak, nausea, and extreme fatigue, she swam over for over 15 hours. A heavy fog set in on the coastline. Temperature began to change, and Florence breathing became labored. Since she couldn't see the shore, she feared she was swimming in circles and lost hope. The skilled athlete did something she had never done before. Florence gave up and asked to be pulled from the waters. She learned that she had stopped half a mile short of her goal. Like Florence, we too can lose hope, but the apostle Peter pointed to the sure hope we have in Christ. We may become weary and discouraged, but victory is much closer than we realize. It's all because our hope is in Christ. Amen. Okay, we start at uh, 1 Peter 1, 1 through 3. Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethany, Elected according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Key words in foreknowledge, verse 2. Literally to know beforehand, because God has both omnipotent and omnipotent. He not only knows, but he works through people and events to accomplish his eternal plan. Sanctification. To sanctify is to make something or someone holy, to set the things or a persons apart for God's purpose. Peter has become one of the main leaders of the church after Jesus' death. Resurrection and Ascension. Uh, his ministry was primary to the Jews in Galatians 2, 7 to 8. Let's look at that. Uh, Galatians 2. Galatians 2. But contrary. Uh, but contra Contrarized, where they saw the gospel of the uncircumcised was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter. Um, see if we remember that. Two, seven, yeah, and they, for he that wrought effective in Peter to the apostle of the circumcision, the same was my 
mighty to me toward the Gentile. So then Jesus had charged him to tend the flock by feeding and nurturing them. And John uh, 21, let's look at John 21. In the one fifteen to seventeen. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, Lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He has said unto him, Feed my lamb. He said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord. You know that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. 17. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, love thou me. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. As thou knowest that I love thee, Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Peter was one of the Jesus' twelve apostles which meant he was set with full authority to carry the gospel and spread the message of the kingdom of God. Peter's letter reflects his care for God's people. Peter loves these Christian followers and wrote to encourage them not to give up, lose hope, or grow weary. He reiterated this purpose when he chose his letter by Silvanus a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God with whom you stand, 1 Peter 5, 12. So why did these people need hope? The opening verse tells us that uh, they were strangers scattered all through the Roman Empire in Northern Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. Exile is often a form of punishment, but that was not the case for these believers. They were exiled and estranged because this world was not their home. For all of us who have placed our trust in Christ, this world is not our permanent residence. We live as strangers in exile because our conversation is in heaven, Philippians 3.20. We live in this world for a time, but we are citizens in heaven. We are headed for a better world than the, the one we now know, better than the one we now know, amen. As we read through 1 Peter, it's because it's clear that believers will face opposition and suffering. Life was not all sunshine and rainbows from those who followed Christ. Nero was the Roman emperor at that time, at this time. And he was known for his cruelty. Peter may have been writing before Nero's brutal opposition against Christian became known, but he recognized the opposition would continue to intensify, First Peter 4, 12. He wanted these men and women to be ready, hold fast to their hope in Christ. In light of these trials, some of the believers perhaps wondered if they had fallen out of favor of God. Was the Christ life worth it? And could they persevere in the midst of difficulty and strife? These are questions. In answer to these questions, Peter reminds them that their identity, God has chosen nothing about their salvation and life in Christ was based on their own initiative. They have been chosen by the Father and have experienced sanctification of the Spirit. God does not call us to salvation, but he gives us the Holy Spirit so that we might be sanctified, set apart, and become more and more like Jesus. This new identity points to the purpose, to a purpose, or obedience. Whether circumstances are easy or incredibly challenged, our selection by God and sanctification by the Spirit are to result in our obedience to Christ. Understand this identity and keep this purpose in view 
uh, would be critical for Peter's initiative readers to living out their faith in a hostile environment. Peter then told, uh, turned his attention to one of the main themes of his writing in this letter, hope. Ancient Rome had a saying, while there's life, there's hope. But Warren Risby reminds us, like most adage, it has an element of truth, but no guarantee of certainty. It is not the fact of life that determines hope, but the faith of life. We have a living hope by placing our faith in God. This lively hope has been secured for us by Christ, by Christ's finished work on the cross. It's not based on a positive mindset, wishful thinking, or a striving to make things work. Living hope is ours because we uh, we've been chosen by God, saved by, the, saved by the death and resurrection of the Son, and set apart by His Spirit. What's the difference between living hope and other sources of hope? Uh, I think just above there is our hope is in Christ, and, uh, and, uh, and it's a finished work uh, was the resurrection set apart uh, by His Spirit. The other one is just hope and uh, and uh, in life, you know, and uh, so uh, there's no guarantee. That hope is no guarantee, but our guarantee is in Christ. What Christ did for us on the cross, and is now uh, at the right hand of God the Father, and uses the Holy Spirit. So that's our. Okay, in 1 Peter 1, 4, and 5. To inherit incorruptible and undefiled, and that faith is not a way we serve in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. After reminding his reader of their identity and purpose, Peter elevated their viewpoint and lifted their eyes to see that this living hope is kept in heaven. Yeah. Our hope is secure for eternity. Not, uh, nothing can diminish it, corrupt it, divert it, or destroy it. Amen. Thank you for that. John Hess of the Bohemian priest, uh, who held to the truth of scripture and his final, as his final authority, before being burned at the stake for his belief in 1415, he wrote, our inheritance will never lose anything through age or sickness on our part or through any damage in itself. It will never be marred by impurity and it will never be lessened in delight because it has been enjoyed so long. Peter describes this inheritance using three express, expression rich in meaning, incorruptible. Our inheritance in Christ cannot be stolen and won't succumb to decay. Incorruptible describes a territory uh, to secure that no invading forces can destroy it. Peter assured believers that no one can take away our inheritance and nothing can separate us from it. Undefiled, the word relates to the purity of our inheritance. Our inheritance is thoroughly fire resistant and in every respect unstained by the world, it is completely and wholly pure. Fade not away. Our inheritance will never lose its glory. Our treasures may diminish in their appearance or value in full time, but our inheritance in Christ will never go dull, never become dim, never destroy, never fade. Praise the Lord. Peter reminds believers that we are kept by the power of God. This paints the picture of the fortress that has been built beyond any and all dangers, costly shield and garrison by God. Hallelujah. This same power protects the three young men in Nebuchadnezzar fiery furnace, Daniel 
316 to 30. Let's, let's look at that. Uh, you probably all know that. But, uh, Daniel 316. Okay, Daniel 316. Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship thy golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and in the form of his vintage, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it will want to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats their hoes and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king commanded was urgent that the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames of fire, fire slew those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselor, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, the true O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire. And they have no hurt, and the form of the four is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth, come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst of the fire, and the prince, governor, and captains. And the king council were being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was any hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of the fire had passed on them. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servant and trust him and changed the king's word and yield their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. <coughs> Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language will speak any thing amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be a dunghill because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Then King promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the province of Babylon. And then, uh, and the guard Daniel in the den of lions, uh, you know, that one. And the shield Paul thought shipwreck, beaten, hunger, and in prison. Second Corinthians 11 24 28. Uh, these are three, three examples of. Uh, you know, remaining in God's trust and God's protecting through all kinds of different uh, challenges here. You know, God's power will keep them the recipient to Peter's letter during oppression and prosecution, and it will keep us no matter what we face. These verses were not idle words from Peter. His hope was secure, and he wrote from the firm conviction of ground and truth. We can trust. <coughs> Excuse me. 
we can trust in these same truths and stand firmly in our hope in Christ. Even when circumstances may tempt us to believe otherwise. Without good theological roots and the truth of God's word, we are subject to the, to the whims of the culture and downward pull of negative people in our own feelings. In our own feelings, we, we hope seems lost in negative winds, and they we allow people and circumstances to rule our mind instead of renewing our minds and His truth. <coughs> Never forget who God is and what He done for us through Christ and what we serve for us in heaven. Amen. That's a powerful paragraph right there. Uh, God always always listen to God and not what people because people uh, sometimes lead you astray, you know. So um Okay, um, question three. How does people describe our inheritance given us hope in the present? Well, our inheritance is, is in Christ. Uh, no one can take it away. Our inheritance is uh, uh, nothing can separate it from us. And we are kept by the power of God. Just like uh, examples of Daniel and uh, that uh, the Hebrews uh, cheat, uh, um, okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, just like the list of there, Daniel, Daniel, and um, three Hebrew boys, and and uh, Paul, as they went through there, God protect them. We go, we go through trials, and that God will protect us. So. Never give up when we got that hope, uh, that everlasting hope. First uh, Peter one six to nine. And then there were, ye great uh, rejoice, wherein ye greatly rejoice. So now for a season, if need be, you are in heaven through manifest temptation, that the trials of your faith, being much more precious than the gold that perish, though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory as the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now you see him not, ye believe, ye rejoice with a joyful, unspeakable, and full of glory, receiving at the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. For the believer Peter was addressed, and the faith helped them endure the suffering they were facing. Their hope in the future kept their hearts fixed on Christ and the promise of an everlasting inheritance. Our hope is in Christ. It displays in our faith. Faith and hope are intertwined. John Piper noted the connection. I would suggest that faith is the larger idea and hope is necessary part of biblical faith. Hope is the part of faith that focuses on the future. In biblical terms, when faith is directed to the future, you can call it hope. But faith can focus on the past and the present too. So faith is, in larger terms, you might put it this way. Faith is our confidence in the word of God. And, when, and whenever the word has referred to in the future, you can call our confidence in it hope. Hope is faith in the future tense. Many things distinguish those who make up the body of Christ. We have different personalities, temperaments, backgrounds, and preference. But we all have one thing in common, the experience of pain and tears. We all go through suffering in some form. In this letter, Peter refers to godly people and their suffering 15 times. However, based on God's power and our inheritance, the righteous can rejoice in the midst of trials or suffering we face. In these verses, we see five characteristics of trial. Trials and temptation vary in nature, manifold temptation. Trials come in all shapes and sizes. Trials are temporary. 
though now for a season. God allows us to go through the furnace, but as a refiner, he controls the thermostat. Our trials are limited in the face of eternity. Trials are difficult. Ye are, ye are in heaviness. This phrase carries the idea of grief. The verb means to experience pain. Grief is or distress. Trials are taxing and they can drain us physical, emotional, mentally, mentally, rationally. Let's face it, trials are tough. Trials have a purpose. Trials of your faith. God is refined by extreme heat to remove impurities and thus increase in value. A Christian is refined by God to be a reflection of his glory. God refines processes is intended to remove those things that keep us from being like Jesus. And this offers uh, often occurs through the fire of suffering. In our faith, we can be tested, and then it can be trusted. The trials forge into a strong faith. Smile. And I think that's what this country is going through right now. It's, it's, it's this trial. You know what I mean? So, uh, trials of the faith, and it brings out what what's inside, you know. Uh, uh, you know, it's physical, emotional, mental, and retaliation. Let's face trials are tough. And, you know, this country is going through a lot of trials you now. Uh, trials should be result in rejoicing might be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The consummating glorious reality of our trials is the revelation of Jesus. One day we will see him and know him fully. We may not see him in our trials, or we may think he is distant, but he is there. It will be worth it all when we see him. Paul reminded the Corinthian believers, our light of affliction, which is but a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and an eternal weight of glory. Second Corinthians 4 17. And the same is true for us today. What are the benefits of living with hope that is grounded in Christ? And I put uh, I put verse nine. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. That's what I put there. And uh, question five, how has God used our group in the refining process of our lives to engage us to consider these things which people sometimes base their hope for the future? Write a sentence explaining each in, inadequate money, power, friends, position, personal ability. Describe how Jesus provides a sound foundation for our hope. So you can do that uh, later on. Live it out. When tempted to despair and give up in defeat, remember that you have a living hope secured by Christ. Recognize, admit to God the errors you are losing hope. Confess any sin and ask him to open your eyes the reality of living hope in Christ. Remember, read to 1 Peter, verse 1 to 9, again, and make a list of how Peter describes those who follow and trust in Christ. Place this list in a prominent place to remind you of who you are in Christ. Restore. And this, is there someone the Lord has brought to your mind who is losing hope? Take time to meet or call them this week and share the truth the Lord has shown you in the study. And then we want to read, uh, there's hope in Peter. This is a little extra. Uh, we'll read that right there. It says, and it's by Gerald L. Stevens, Hope in First Peter, uh, Hope in First Peter. After the New Orleans Saints football franchise was created in 1967, the team languished in the doldrum of defeat. I, along with the loyal fans, 
waited every year with eager expectation for the next season. 43 years we waited. Suddenly, like living a dream, plans slowly paid off when the Saints won Super Bowl. Uh, I don't know what number, LXIV, whatever, I don't know what number, in 2010. The New Orleans Explode was exuberant celebration. An estimate of 800,000 screen fans lined the screen for the victory parade. They waited for their head bloke to turn the corner with almost unbearable. I uh, cranked my neck in confidence, expecting the coach, said uh, Sid Payton, the Super Bowl trophy would soon be coming around the bend. I had hoped to see the victorious team. I had hoped uh, for the trophy. I had a solid reason for that hope because the Saints were champions. Confident expectation. Sometimes we do not reflect on the extent in which hope powers our everyday life. The power of hope is fundamental to Christian life. Christian hope powers the Christian's life. Christian's hope is the confidence, the expectation that what God has brought us in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Got dry, so I had to. <coughs> Christ's hope is in the confident expectation of what God has promised in Jesus Christ. God will deliver such hope will uh, carefully need to be distinguished from wishful thinking. Wishful thinking has no solid reason as its basis. As a result, open general conversations mean uncertainty about the outcome. Christian hope, on the other hand, is a com completely different reality. Christian hope is the opposite. Christian hope is the certainty about the outcome. The outcome. This hope has a solid reason as a basis. As a basis. This hope is solidly based on what God has already done. God already has sent his son to die for our sins and raised Jesus from the grave. First Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10. This battle already has been fought and the game already won. The victorious team will be coming around the corner any moment with trophy in hand. One of the greatest epistles of Christian hope is First Peter. Because we are even three verses into this wonderful epistle, the word hope uh, figures prominently in the opening benediction. Blessed be the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has regenerated us unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The way we would say in this but it be, is done to fill why uh, was the message so amazing to Peter's audience because the ancient world did not have hope. Stalin mentioned the Greek word for hope in 1 Peter 3.15 is Elpis. This word is defined three ways in terms of expect, expected longing and reason for certain in terms of in terms of its ground and in terms of its object. The Christian life is filled with courageous hope and expectant anticipation, expected anticipation that is reflected even created itself, Romans 8, 18, 21. The ground of Christian hope is what God already has accomplished in Jesus by raising, raising him from the dead. The object hope is God himself in 1 John 3, 2. Uh, let's, read it. let's read that. Romans 8, 18 to 21. Eight, 18 to 21. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be carried with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
with an earnest expectation of the creature with for the manifestation of the sons of God. Uh, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing by, uh, but by reason of him who does subject the same hope. Because the creature itself also should be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And then let's look at uh, 1 John 3, 2. Three, three, two says, Beloved, now are we sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then look at uh, Acts 22 6. Acts 22 6. But when God perceived that the one part of, uh, but when God perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of the Pharisees, in the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Since God has accomplished a new life in Jesus, who already has been resurrected from the grave, the object of hope also can be described as being brought a glory to Jesus, Hebrews 10. Peter's favorite way of speaking this truth is to describe Christian hope as a living hope. First Peter, the hope is living because the object of the hope is living. Amen. No other philosophy in this ancient world has such a marvelous message based on such solid ground. Intensively, one will search long and hard to find much discussion of hope in the ancient world. Major philosophies were uh, propounded without even having such to say about the uh, Stoicism. I don't know how to pronounce it. Even Todd Hope was a vice of a non virtue. Cynicism seems more to rule this day without knowledge of a person or a caring God. Why would cynicism not prevail? Those outside the Christian faith are, as Paul so well said, without hope and without God in the world. Jesus 2.12. The attitude one sees in the playwright, so uh, so, uh, so uh, least one of the most famous Greek tragedy writers from the fifth century BC, might have been common among citizens walking in the streets of Athens. Uh, I don't know what that was. So, so, so us the man dead man. Not to be born is beyond all innovation. Best, but when a man has seen the light of day, this is next best by far, that without, with utmost speed, he should go back where he came, where he came. The Christian, the Christian message flooded into this void of the human heart in the ancient world without an overwhelming message of God's love. In John 3 16, the next glory miracle for the glorious future, Romans 5 2 and 8 24. Peter excelled believers to be ready at any moment to explain the hope that is in you, 1 Peter 3 15. Uncertainty of the outcome of faith never was the hallmark of Christian preaching. Christian hope was a core to the preaching that produces the unique message not heard anywhere else in the world. This is those without faith do not understand Christ's hope. Christ's hope is based on what God actually did in Christ. 
and a challenge troop to try to fathom, yet meeting the needs of every human heart, verse 16. We all need God in Christ to meet that need. We need hope. God in Christ meets that need. Amen. So it's what Christ already done. That is our hope. It's secure and nothing. This following word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the hope you give us, Lord, through Christ uh, coming down here and dying for our sins and the resurrection of the Holy Lord. Uh, and he sits at the right hand of God, the Father, in the evil prayers right now. Lord, we ask that you intervene, Lord, in all the prayer requests that were asked today. Lord, we lift them up to you, that you would uh, bless them according to your will, Lord, and that, uh, uh, that they would uh, we be obedient to your holy word as we hear from you, Lord, as you are the hope, Lord, that we can share in the gospel of Christ and what you've done in our lives, Lord. That we got the hope of eternal life, that we just passing through uh, this world here as it is, and our hope is uh, in eternal being with you, Lord, Heavenly Father. Uh, we thank you that uh, we have that hope, and that, that all believers have that hope, and we can share that with others, Lord, and invite more to Christ, Lord, and have them come to know you as the Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray for all those out there in the world. Day that they know you, Lord. We pray that you keep just uh, put someone in a pathway, Lord, and let them know that, that Christ is here and He loves you and He will keep you and, and, and He wants you to be part of His plan and that He came down here and died for your sin so that you can have salvation through Christ our Lord and Savior and living God. We thank you for your spirit, Lord. We thank you for this lesson today and this continuing lessons of First Peter. Uh, all through that we'll be discussing for a few uh, letters. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. We give you the glory and honor. All of you. Thank you, and, and we pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So our, our next lesson will be. Do I look up the honor? Will be. Uh, the, the expression of our hope, and that will be First Peter 1, 13 through 25. The next Wednesday will be on the expression of our hope, First Peter 1, 13 to 25. And meanwhile, you go through this lesson, this, you go through a couple of times, and every time you bring something more out of it, you apply it to our life. So we thank you. And we uh, thank you for watching and, and reading along with us, Lord. And uh, that uh, the Lord is good. And I praise Him all the time. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you next Wednesday.